Okay, thank you all for coming. If you're here on a day like today, you absolutely have nothing better to do because it is awfully nice outside. Um, at this time, I will call the uh, Solid Waste uh, Management Authority of the City of Crescent City and the County of Del Norte to order. Uh, we are now meeting in regular session. Only those items that indicate a specific time will be heard at the assigned time. All other items may be taken out of sequence to accommodate the public and staff availability. Okay, so um, at this time we will have public comment. Any member of the public may address the Solid Waste Management Authority on any matter off or on the agenda. After receiving recognition from the chair, please give your name and address for the record. Comments will be limited to three minutes. Is there any public comment? Mr. Miles. Did we have that? Oh. Mr. Hemmingson, yes, sir. I think I owe you an apology. Accepted. I think I owe some of the rest of these members an apology too. But at the same time, I have to say, and I wasn't here for a special session of the Solid Waste Task Force because I was out of town, but I believe we do have a problem what I'd like to call either the ordinance mafia or, or what I've called the Nazi brigade. And I would hope because of the hard work that a lot of members of the task force have done, that you really take some time to look at your ordinances. Also, I want to report that I had the opportunity to visit a well-run solid waste authority and a dump in Marina, California. My dad had a special little project that I had to help him with. They have a one-stop store. We went out there and for 10 cents a brick, we purchased bricks from the Spreckle Sugar Factory to do a yard project. A lot of times, we have landscapers and construction projects that material could be recycled and would utilize the acreage out to the transfer station. Thank you, Richard. Any other public comment, Andy? I need to apologize to the board and the staff for my outburst in the last meeting. I know the rules, I was told the rules, and I broke the rules. And that is not the way it should be. And I do honestly apologize. Thank you. Thank you, Andy. Any other public comment? Wesley Nunn, I'm a Solid Waste Task Force uh, member. Uh, Mary Wilson asked me to read something. Uh, Wes, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to bring that up, the report from the Solid Waste Task Force, if you'll wait until, if there's no other public comment, you can stay right there. Is there any other public comment? Okay, then I'm going to close the public comment period, and we're going to move on to a report from the Solid Waste Task Force. Well, she's not available today. Mary Wilson, she's as not. chairperson of the Yeah, I, I know she asked uh, you to read, read something. And this is just... The re 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 I mean, read the report. Yeah. The task force held two agenda meetings with one special meeting since the last JPA meeting. The two meetings were used to inform task force members of the work done by the subcommittee on Ordinance 2008-01. After the last JPA meeting, and in concurrence with the task force, we have reached out to authority staff as well as county and city code enforcement for, infor and for input prior to any recommendation. 
The subcommittee had drafted questions for the authority on input as to the effects and outcomes of the ordinance. As of this time, we have been unable to get this detailed information from authority staff due to their time constraints. They have returned an estimate of information near August 31st. We had staff present during the special meeting and had an excellent input from both Dave Mason and Kevin Hendricks as to the enforcement and purpose behind certain aspects of the ordinance. Further information both from the authority and legal counsel is needed prior to the task force making a recommendation. And let's see, and I actually had a, what might be public comment. Oh, question. okay, well I didn't mean to keep Sorry. you from public comment, so go ahead. Um, just my own personal concern, there's been quite a bit of discussion on the board regarding whether a board of five can legally pass an ordinance which is binding on both city and county. And I don't believe, my personal opinion is I don't believe we can make this determination without opinion from legal counsel. Of course, if the board of 10 passes a rule that only the board of 10 may pass an ordinance, then a legal uh, opinion probably wouldn't be necessary. Uh, I believe board member Finnegan pointed out that even with the board of 10, three votes from each city and county may be required to be binding on both city and county. And I think that needed legal opinion, so perhaps the board might wish to direct counsel to provide a legal opinion to conclusively determine if a board of five can pass binding ordinances. Thank you. Thank you. Any other public any other public comment? No. Oh, go ahead. Just for clarification, when we amended the JPA, we put language in the JPA on how and if an ordinance were to be approved, it would have to be first approved, it would have to be approved by both the city and the county to go into effect. Okay, thanks. Okay, any public comment on the uh, report from the Salt Waste Task Force? Okay, we're going to move on to the consent agenda then. We have minutes from Tuesday, June 26th and Tuesday, July 24th and a resolution keeping intact the Brown Act. <coughs> Move to approve. Second. Any public comment? On anything that's on the consent agenda? Okay, Richard. of the Brown Act enforced. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. Any other public comment on the consent agenda? Seeing no other public comment. I'm sorry, Supervisor? Oh, I'm sorry. I'd like go ahead and like to close public comment. Um, seeing no other public comment, then bring it back to this board. Is there Any a discussion? reason we, this is just more of a question. Um, is there a reason we don't have May's minutes posted on the website? We don't have May's minutes posted on the website. You've only got up till April, and I understand why June, obviously June, July can't be until the Board of Prison, but May's minutes should be on our website, and they're not posted currently. Okay, okay. Okay, thanks. Rose, would you pull the vote, please? Commissioner Holly? Yes. Commissioner Westfall? Yes. Commissioner Murray? Yes. Commissioner Schwong? Yes. Commissioner Ania? Yes. Commissioner McNamer? Yes. Commissioner McClure? Yes. Commissioner Sullivan? Yes. Chair Hamilton? Yes. Thank you. Okay, we're going to move on to the director's report. Kevin, you have anything to add? Uh, no, there. it's all information for, for you to, I assume you've read it, and I'll answer any questions if you have any. 
Any questions from uh, board members? Donna? Um, actually, this goes back to something that was said in April 24th meeting um, regarding uh, feasibility for potential privatization uh, by McNamer and Hemmingson directed Hendricks to report on research on privatization. And I just don't believe we've had anything. So, um, Commissioner Hemmingson, I'd like to hand in this agenda request to direct the task force or the subcommittee to evaluate privatization, bring a report by September 12th meeting. Okay, yeah, thank you. We're gonna talk about priorities later in the agenda. So that would be a good time to, uh, to uh, bring that up. Any other comments or questions on the director's report, Mr. Holling? Just one quick question for, for uh, Kevin. RCRC Environmental Services, what, what's that? What is RCRC? Uh, the county's a member of the regional council of rural counties. It's, uh, I think, 22 rural counties. Uh, David Finnegan is on the board of directors for RCRC. And oh, yeah, he's a board member, I'm sorry. He's a board member, yeah. yes. Uh, so David attends the RCRC board meetings and then they have an offshoot which is uh, an actual joint powers authority called the Environmental Services Joint Powers Authority, um, which is also uh, the board of directors technically is elected officials, but generally it's uh, staff members like myself that attend um, every other month when I can attend to discuss the new regulations that are coming up, uh, positions that we should take and commenting on regulations. It's a, a good opportunity to work with other rural counties to make sure that our voice gets heard in Sacramento. And it's um, a very efficient way for me to get information from people that are on the ground working every day. So it's, uh, it's worth the money if you think about the cost of a consultant that would do the same things for us. It's $6,000 a year that we pay. Technically, we pay on behalf of the county because the county's the member and Okay, thank you. I know other RCRC, so I didn't, I, I wasn't familiar with this one. Mr. So. Chair, I have a comment. Uh, yes. I, I just mm -hmm. wanted to make a comment regarding the daily ticket sheet for July when we had discussion at our last meeting regarding uh, shutting down days or hours on each one of the transfer stations, and we re realized that it didn't seem like it would be very economically feasible to do that. Um, there were nine days that had less than 159.5 um, tickets. And one of those days was 4th of the July, which of course had zero. So I think that we have a pretty good um, business every day at the transfer stations. And I just wanted to point that out. Okay, thank you. Any other questions from board members, Kevin? Any public comment on the director's report? Okay, we are gonna move on then. Uh, we have no agenda items for landfill, post-closure, collections, franchise, transfer station. So we're gonna move on to general solid waste authority matters. Um, we have a budget transfer, $2,239, Kevin. Yeah, um, there are three budget transfers in, in sequence. The first two are uh, adjusting the grant carryovers. We have two grants. This one is the beverage container recycling grant. When we put together the budget, we take our best guess as far as trying to calculate how much of that money is carrying over to the next fiscal year, and we're rarely exactly right. So yeah, this, this, this is very close. This reduces it down to the actual amount that carried over for the beverage container grant. The next one does the same thing for the oil recycling grant. And so it's sort of the same story for both of them. Great. In the interest of being brief. Motion. Move to approve a budget transfer request in the amount of 2239 carryover for the 2011-12 beverage container recycling grant. Second. Okay, I have a motion and a second. Any public comment on these budget transfers? You don't want to sit by us? Who no. is second? Seeing no public comment, then I'm going to bring it uh, back. Uh, Rose, would, any, any more discussion? Rose, would you pull the vote, please? Commissioner Ania? Yes. Commissioner Schlong? Yes. Commissioner Westfall? Yes. Commissioner Hawley? Yes. Commissioner Murray? Yes. Commissioner McNamer? Yes. Commissioner McClure? Yes. Commissioner Sullivan? Yes. Commissioner Finnegan? Yes. 
That's it. Chair Hamilton? Yes. Thank you. You're, you're entirely welcome. Okay, moving on. Uh, Kevin is going to give us a little uh, PowerPoint. Uh, we have two more. We got oh, two more sevens. Seven, well, two, you didn't do seven, them all. Three. You didn't do them all. No, yep. they're all different. Uh, oh, okay. Funds. They're all different. I can, I'm just happy to. Sorry, I'm. I move to approve a budget transfer uh, in the amount of twenty-six hundred dollars to replace the dedicated pump uh, at the landfill. I also move to. Um, Oh, I guess that's it. The one right in front. Yeah, How about it? Right above it. Oh, sorry. Seven point two. <laughs> now, I'm, now you got me confused. I'm sorry. Uh, I thought you did them all. I'm sorry. And approve a budget transfer request in the amount of thirteen ninety two, carry over for the two thousand eleven twelve used oil recycling grant. Second. I have a motion and a second. Public comment, Richard. Twenty six zero zero point zero zero is a lot of money to replace a pump that was stolen from the landfill. Now my question, you're gonna to vote today to replace this pump, but is staff gonna come up with creative ways to prevent uh, this pump from being stolen again? Because if you have something out there and it's kind of out there and you get vandals who, even though there's a gate at the entrance of the old dump, you would think that before you would spend this money, you would direct st staff to come up with creative ways to prevent the pump from being stolen again. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other public comment? Okay, see no other. Probably, but we're probably self-insured, so. Jeff? Did you have a question? I asked if it was covered under insurance. Probably not, but we're gonna check into that. If I, if I can, I can ask Ted to describe the circumstance that it would have taken to steal this pump. It's not like we just left the pump sitting out on the ground. It's, Ted, go ahead just briefly. Uh, these are dedicated pumps. Uh, we have a, a driver and the dedicated pump is in a locked well casing. Uh, they filed off the lock and we've since replaced the locking mechanism so that we think it's uh, more vandal proof than it was before and we wanted, we did those repairs before requesting that we replace the pump. Thank you. Is this like a sump pump? No, it's not like a sump pump at all. It's a dedicated it pump actually sits used in specifically for <coughs> well monitoring and purging wells and well testing. Any other questions? Comments? Nope. Just, okay. just, just for clarification, this is at the landfill, not at the transfer station. At the landfill. Right, at the landfill. Okay. Yeah, we, we have insurance that covers theft at the landfill, and we had a generator that <coughs> partially got covered previously, or a, a, a different kind of pump that got stolen out of our trailer. Um, just on the general issue of theft, we've had ongoing regular break-ins at the transfer station, and Hambro's had a lot of things taken. But just today, yesterday, combination of yesterday and today, a sheriff came, they took a report because the Hambro guys we had an idea where they were coming from. They tracked these guys down, found them at their house, found the product at their house, and um, we Good. hope very, very much that the sheriff will prosecute these people to provide a deterrent for anybody else that thinks about coming onto our property and stealing. Right. Okay, anything else? Rose, will you pull the vote, please? Commissioner Sullivan? Yes. Commissioner McClure? Yes. Commissioner McNamer? Yes. Commissioner Finnegan? Yes. Commissioner Ania? Yes. Commissioner Schlong? Yes. Commissioner Murray? Yes. Commissioner Westfall? Yes. Commissioner Holly? Here, yes. Chair Hamington? Yes. Thank you. Okay, now we will move on. 7.4. Kevin, give us a little PowerPoint on 
Ordinance 2008-01, please. Our favorite subject. This um, has been updated since I provided it to the Solid Waste Task Force. At your request, I did provide a version of this to the Solid Waste Task Force to help initiate conversations. Um, this was adopted in uh, uh, 2008, and we've been uh, working on implementing it ever since. Um, we had a public hearing a couple uh, months ago uh, to provide additional input from landlords because there's been some questions about how landlords comply. Um, almost since day one in adopting this, we've had landlords that ask whether they couldn't just comply by putting a lease requirement that their tenants sign up for garbage service. And it's always been our position that that meets the intent, if not the letter. So that's been the issue that's been outstanding. Um, the other issues that we've heard concern about uh, in includes the requirement that regular just average Joe self haulers have to be registered. I want to address that today. Um, clarifying when it's a misdemeanor versus an administrative citation because the landlords are concerned they're going to go to jail because their tenant dumps some garbage and that's certainly not the intent. And then uh, probably uh, last but not least is um, clarifying the responsibility of tenants. If the landlord does provide garbage service that the tenants have a clear responsibility to utilize that service and also not dump their garbage inappropriately. So I'm going to wing through some, some highlights on this. You have a full copy of the ordinance in front of you. Anybody that's in watching from TV land, um, this ordinance is on our website and can be downloaded and reviewed as well. Um, the previous Solid Waste Task Force started working on this uh, initiative in January 2007 as looking at possible strategies to end illegal dumping and blight. Initially, there was a conversation about mandatory collection and the task force uh, recommended against that in favor of continuing to allow self haulers. The t Solid Waste Task Force met 11 times between January and December 2007 and made recommendations for ordinances. Then they held a public workshop March 10th, 2008 to get input from the public. Um, following that, the board consensus was to work with legal counsel to draft the three main ordinances, which is the Solid Waste and Recycling Responsibility Ordinance, the Nuisance Abatement Ordinance, and the Administrative Citation Ordinances. Um, those were adopted in a series of two meetings, September, October um, 2008. <coughs> Purpose of this was that there seemed to be a general recognition there's a problem with accumulation of garbage on property, there's a problem with the illegal dumping, and these legislative findings basically uh, assert and, and reaffirm that uh, accumulation of garbage is a public health concern and that um, anybody that's hauling or handling um, waste or recyclables need to do it in, in an appropriate way. Next. The purposes of this ordinance is to establish responsibilities for everybody, property owners, businesses, producers, government agencies, discard uh, regarding discard management and acceptable management methods that don't damage uh, the county or our aesthetic values. Next. This one is an important one. Um, when we met with the task force, Dave Mason was there. I don't know if Dave's here today. Uh, I thought it was very helpful to have Dave Mason at the last Tuesday's Solid Waste Task Force meeting because he's on the ground. He knows what tools he needs to make this work. Some questions have come up regarding, well, isn't there a state law? And the answer is, well, that's a criminal, and then it has to go through the courts, and that's a, that's a problem. The administrative citations give a tool where it's possible to uh, not involve the courts and to target people that are either dumping illegally or accumulating trash. And this statement right here, that each party has an affirmative responsibility, is an important tool in the sense that if you find garbage dumped in a ditch and it's got your name or it came from your property, you are responsible for it being there because you have a responsibility to make sure that you either haul it yourself and get it to the right place or haul the garbage, hire the garbage company to get it to the right place, but you have an obligation. So you can no, no longer have a defense that says, I hired a guy with a pickup truck and I could have swore he was gonna go to the right place. So it starts narrowing down the excuses that people have by making everybody affirmatively responsible. Next. The section I threw in here, and this was discussed with the task force, and, and Joel kind of had an aha moment because this affects Hammer also. When we did these, when we worked with the task force over that period of a year, and then the period of time that we worked with the board after that, we did look at the city ordinances, county ordinances, other county ordinances, and one of the things we found was 
a Supreme Court case in New York with a joint powers authority that passed an ordinance that basically said, you know, we have all these obligations to recycle, to meet recycling uh, mandates, to handle hazardous waste, to do all the things that nobody else does. So we need to have the ability to tell all the private haulers, everybody that operates in the county, to bring their garbage to our transfer station so that everybody pays the same fees and everybody contributes to this. So these six sentences, although they seem simple, are basically our, our flow control section that allowed us to convince um, the company collecting garbage from the prison that they should bring their garbage through the transfer station. Um, that uh, move right there uh, brings in, a, or, or a deletion of these sections right here would cost us about $120,000 a year in lost revenue. So we strongly recommend keeping this. Um, setting standards for the franchise collector. We have one company that's authorized and permitted to collect garbage. And this just sets some exceptions, but primarily states that um, collecting for a fee if you're not the franchise, is not allowed. So if you're the guy with the pickup truck, you can't go around and have a regular garbage collection route. Next. Can I add just one second? Yeah. Oh, please stop me anytime, because I'm going to try to rip to through me, this, but stop me if you need um, to. What that section does is it then stabilizes the, <coughs> the franchise agreement, so the franchisor has a, a clue of when they put in their bid of how much garbage they're going to pick up. Because if it were Joe Schmo on the street could start a garbage service and do it, then our then we wouldn't be able to have the what I consider great service that we have from Ecology right now, because it would start cutting into the bottom line, and that's the reality of why we have the single collector. Exactly. I mean, the the franchise company is a is a large company, but they follow all the rules. They have all the insurance. They they follow the the. the standards of hauling all this stuff and they know the difference between hazardous and non-hazardous so you're saying that before this ordinance was in place the franchise e did not have no, the sole exclusive. <coughs> exclusive responsibility of hauling the garbage well what i'm trying to say is before this ordinance was adopted we didn't really have the tools necessary to stop the pickup truck haulers from hauling garbage in competition with the franchise Really? Interesting. Yeah. Well, I, I just, I don't yeah. know how you can give a franchise to someone and then not have any way to protect them. So well, I don't know how that could have ever happened in the past. There's always been franchise. The garbage has always been under a franchise. There's a single collector. There's always been problems with third-party haulers, and this <coughs> has, has slowed that down, if not put a stop to it. Um, the, the task force, the last task force, had a good amount of discussion. It was made up of citizens like, like yourselves that really wanted to protect the right of people to be self haulers. And so when there was a responsibility to do something, they didn't really want to go straight to mandatory, even though that conversation continues to come up. And even at the last task force meeting, it was suggested by one member, it would be so much easier just pass a law, make everybody sign up for garbage service, everybody's got it, everybody has to comply. And that would be would be easier, but not necessarily better for the in individuals that are self haulers. So, it was it was recommended by the task force and adopted by the board that um, responsibility is mandatory, but subscription to garbage service is not mandatory. So people can continue to self haul their own garbage. Next. Um, in this ordinance, is inserted some pretty good details on what. Uh, Landlords are supposed to take care of a good chunk of the illegal dumping comes from renters, um, especially renters that don't have garbage service. Um, so this started to put a responsibility that uh, landlords provide service to their tenants. Next. Uh, landlords and anybody else that's a responsible party, homeowner or otherwise, can continue to be a self hauler unless the code enforcement officer decides that after repeated warnings and failure to comply, that they are not being responsible as self haulers, there is a provision that allows uh, the authority to require that that ne'er do well scoff law must sign up for garbage service. So the only extent that this becomes a mandatory must sign up for garbage service is when somebody has seriously failed at every step of of our efforts to try to get them to comply. Next. Yeah, but if I could, so what happens to the self, the, uh, like Ron's hauling? So 
somebody yeah. has a bunch of junk on their property they want to haul away and don't have the wherewithal to make it themselves. That will still be allowed, uh, David, and, and there's a section a little bit later I'll hit on that in some more detail. Um, if you're a self-hauler, there's some standards. You need to keep the garbage in the load, primarily, um, just even today. You know, the people that don't tarp their loads properly, the garbage bag blows out on the road, it makes things look bad. Um, the proof of responsibility initially had these two options, um, and in just a couple slides, I'm gonna talk about um, the registered self-haulers and how I would recommend that we uh, pare that down to more specific details. Um, but this underlined section A, I think, is not workable and it's not something we really care to do, so I would recommend that that be changed and just ask that people keep their records for six months. Either they're going to have receipts from the garbage company or receipts from coming to the transfer station. And the reason you'd want to have that is if uh, Dave Mason finds a bag of garbage and it has a tenant's name and address and they track it back to your apartment building, but you can show as the landlord that you have a dumpster or you have garbage service. Uh, that's an affirmative defense that you've done the right thing. It's just the tenant. That allows Dave to steer his attention to the person that's being the problem and not the landlord. Next. Um, this is a tool that Dave has used uh, as a code enforcement officer ad advising people that uh, their container, their dumpster's overfilling, it's regularly overfilling, or they don't have enough garbage cans that they should step it up to a larger level of service so that it's adequate for the service that's being provided. Um, this, a uh, few more details on uh, providing service to tenants, that the quality, capacity, diversity, and convenience needs to be as, at least as convenient and comprehensive as the basic services that the garbage company provides. So the franchise sets the standard for what is good service and self-hauling landlords can meet it if they can provide something equivalent to that. Uh, of course, it's only fair that landlords should be able to provide that cost, pass that cost through. So if a landlord signs up for garbage service, actual cost of signing up for that garbage service or the shared cost of dumpsters for a multifamily apartment can be split among the tenants and therefore and thereby giving the tenants an incentive to actually participate in the recycling because if you're in a mobile home park for example and you have a dumpster and you can convince the tenants to use the recycling containers the dumpsters can be smaller or picked up less frequently um, but that cost can be fairly and reasonably passed through to the tenants in parentheses is the first area where I think there needs to be some work if we want to consider allowing uh, landlords to put in their lease that tenants have to subscribe for garbage service. This would be a, a likely place to be able to insert that as a possibility. Um, um, in small apartments with one to four units, it is possible for each one of those tenants to sign up for a garbage can. S but once you get into five or larger units, the only service that's available for that apartment is a dumpster. So uh, there's a distinction as far as what service is available and how much flexibility one could have because if you allowed landlords in five unit or larger apartments to put it in the lease that their tenants would have garbage service or uh, it was just, it's an impracticality that individual tenants can't get the dumpster in the same way. Um, mobile home parks are quite unique, and Andy's helped us understand how that's true uh, because he lives in one, and there's different ways that compliance can happen because if you're in a mobile home park, you, you actually can get, even if it's a 75-unit apartment or 75-unit mobile home park, every individual uh, home can subscribe to garbage service, either individually or, or by the landlord signing them up. At the same sense, mobile home parks can get a centralized dumpster or two. So there's two different ways that mobile homes can uh, comply with that. And re remember the bottom line is making sure that tenants have a place, a proper and legal place to put their garbage so they're not tempted to go dump it in the ditch. Um, even if we had mandatory collection service, you still would want to allow tenants to self-haul or anybody that has extra garbage could haul to the transfer station. So the transfer station is open to any customer and, and it's essentially anonymous in the sense that we don't take anybody's name, we don't really, uh, uh, we give them a random number when they come in and they're allowed to use that. Um, this is a possible section where 
the ordinance could be beefed up a bit to describe how tenants have a responsibility. So it's not all one-sided for the landlords because if I provide the dumpster and the landlord and the tenants don't use it, then what am I going to do? And you have leases for that, but the tenants also should be uh, willing to to do the right thing. And we believe that if there is a dumpster, most tenants are going to put the garbage in the dumpster rather than go to the wrong place. But it's um, there's some. Dave uh, Mason explained to us he's because there was a question about how many citations have been written on this, and, and our answer partially is it's not about the number of citations, it's about getting compliance. And Dave's number one goal when he's out there, our code enforcement officer, is to get people to comply and be responsible. So it's only when he's failed at that that a citation gets written. And uh, his, his ballparky number was 80% of the people are going to comply when you ask them to, and another 10% you're going to have to write tickets, and out of the remaining 10%, there's uh, half or three percent of those that are just going to fight tooth and nail and, and not going to do it. So you're really talking about a fairly small number of people that just won't want to be responsible no matter what, which is why you have all the nasty tools uh, that build and make it worse. I have a question. Yeah. Kevin, before uh, we go past that part of the presentation, one of the mobile home parks in the county, they don't provide service. Um, a lot of the tenants don't have service. But but twice a year, the park would bring in these big dumpsters for everybody to get rid of. You know, they would even let them put furniture, everything, in these dumpsters. But there were probably five of these people that would throw their garbage underneath their mobile home until that dumpster came around. Right. That's something that has got to be addressed. Now, I don't know about, I know the rules in mobile home parks are different as far as the state, you know, a lot of the things in a mobile home park fall under the state um, regulations, not, not ours. How are we gonna be sure that that doesn't happen? Well, I, I think we would find that uh, a dumpster once a year is not adequate. Well, no, even, well, they did two dumpsters, you know. Two dumpsters a year six, is still not adequate. Six, six months. And I mean, when you're talking about garbage, garbage up for that long. when you're talking about putrescible garbage, rotten, stinking, mm -hmm. yes. bringing the flies and rats garbage, that should be moved it, it was a more often than that. And uh, I've also heard stories of landlords that uh, haven't provided garbage service until they get to the end and then they get in a dispute with the tenant and then the garbage gets piled up in the garage or in the yard and they end up having to clean it up afterwards, which is related to David's question about the cleanup businesses. Because then you have to pay somebody in at the end to clean it all up. And ultimately, in the long run, you're better off to have either you pick it up and take it in or a garbage can or a dumpster. So Dave can go into a mobile home park and cite someone? It would be a, a visit to the owner of the mobile home park. Okay, so it's still up to the owner or the manager of the mobile home park. We're in this gray area right, right now where we have a law that says the mobile home park has to sign up for a garbage dumpster or haul it themselves, or in the, in the case of garbage cans, they could sign everybody up for a garbage can. Okay. The possible change would be to allow the mobile home park to tell every tenant they have to sign up for garbage service. So technically that's not a legal option right now, but it's a reasonable option. And in any case, the bottom line is the more people you have signed up for service or responsibly hauling their own garbage, the fewer people are dumping uh, in Pacific Shores. Thank you. Yes. Tommy, can you tell us if there are any issues in the mobile home parks, or if you serve them, or? Come up. Sorry. He was just about asleep. <laughs> <laughs> just kidding. Well, issues like uh, Supervisor McNamer was just referring to. I'm not even sure of what she's referring to, which specific oh, mobile home park it is. Well, I don't I'd want to, I don't want to name. Yeah, and I, I don't want to do it's it. It's not the one I live in. We typically we we're okay. I mean, we've had um, 
one of the mobile home parks that took things a little out of context and said that every tenant had to sign up with us, which we would like, but that's not the rule. I mean, they can sell all, they can, we can put dumpsters in. And, you know, there's a lot of options for these people. But do most of them just do dumpsters? Oh, we have a combination of both. We have dumpsters and we have, we have some that do just the carts. So you don't see a problem in general? No. Okay, thanks. Well, you, you don't have a problem providing either of those varieties of service? No, as long as there's room. I mean, that's the, right. the biggest issue we have is the space. You know, and if the space is there, we can do whatever the, the mobile home park wants to do. Can we do it? Yep. Can we do it? And we have, and we have one mobile home park that is their own self hauler. The, the, the landowner hauls their own. So we have mobile home parks that have signed up for um, uh, bins. We have mobile home parks that have signed each each space its own can. And then we have a mobile home park that's a self hauler. But we used to have a mobile home park that didn't do any of that. Yep. And, twice a year brought in a big container and the people were living in conditions that were really offensive to their children and their health and, and, the, neighbor. and the neighbor who maybe wasn't doing that and so now that's corrected. I can say through this. I can say that since this ordinance has been adopted and some education has been done through this ordinance it has cleaned up some of the spots. I mean, it, at least there's participation where there wasn't. And, it, and I'm sure there's still some out there that we don't know about, you know, that are not participating. Well, one in particular I was speaking of, um, I can go check and see if things have changed since the, it has different managers now. And, and we've, we've had one, without getting into, into details, it was, several years ago that was just a complete dump and they changed ownership and the owners provided individual service for each one of the tenants and it's like wow it's but they included that into the rent too so it they use this ordinance to do that anybody else want to ask tommy some questions while he's up here thank you thanks tommy okay. appreciate it <clears throat> When we were looking at this ordinance, we recognized that businesses are, are, are not the same as households. Households often have the same kind of waste. It looks the same. It, it can be handled the same. There's so many different varieties of business with different kinds of waste. We did already build in uh, flexibility for uh, people who rent, whose tenants are businesses, to uh, allow them to delegate to their tenants to be, to be responsible for handling their own garbage. We thought of the auto shop that was renting a space as an example. It's pretty hard to require a landlord to be responsible for all the chemicals and all the kinds of waste that can come out of an auto shop. Um, so what we're talking about with residential properties is, is something that's already been uh, allowed for in business uh, rentals. When I was talking earlier about we have an exclusive franchise, they're the only ones that can pick up garbage. Uh, you can haul your own garbage, but you can't haul somebody else's garbage. We needed to have some exceptions because there are some businesses where it is a part of their business to haul the, the waste. Let's see what this next slide says. Um, in the definitions, we had A through F. My recommendation is delete. E and F as uh, a, under the definition of registered self haulers because the intention really was to look at the top four kinds of businesses. Go to the next slide, Ted. Um, the landscapers and gardeners, it's part of their job when they trim the trees, when they cut the grass, they haul it and they bring it to us. Uh, clean up businesses for land property owners and landlords, it's an important thing to clean up when a tenant leaves to be able to have that service. So the, the, the businesses that exclusively come in, provide the labor, pick up the waste, clean up the site and haul it away are, are still allowed. A commercial document destruction, there's several companies that come through town to do that. And same thing with uh, construction, demolition, roofing contractors. 
Um, the roofing contractors, they'll scrape a roof off, they'll bring it in, they haul their own. Um, many demolition contractors put it in the dump trucks, 20 yard end dumps, and they bring it in. Um, in farm operations, there's an exception on that, which, I, which is included just because it was, but it's, they're not in the, really the same natural category. The last thing, uh, the last two things I want to cover is, and I won't read this, but um, we need to take a look at um, the enforcement. This is the concern about it's not clear when it's a, when it's a citation, when it's administrative citation uh, versus a misdemeanor. And I think Dave would, would say it's nice to have that as a tool, but in the four years that we've been enforcing this, nobody's ever gotten a misdemeanor violation for normal regular garbage things. Dave's had some fairly large cleanups that were bigger than normal, but um, under our ordinance, we've never uh, enforced a misdemeanor. Next. Yeah, Martha. I just wanted to point something out regarding that section, um, and that is that the violation of city and county codes by state law are punishable as misdemeanors. Um, that's just what the state law is. So that's, even though it's written out in this ordinance, it's not any different than the city or county ordinances. Um, along those same lines, are, are you saying that cities and counties cannot have administrative citations? No. Okay. Yeah. Can you clarify that a little? better for me cities and counties can do we have there are different um, ways to enforce ordinances um, one of them's through an administrative citation program which is a you know civil it's basically a fine program right. doesn't involve criminal penalties that is much easier much convenient for both the agency and whoever the person is who did the violation um, but as a matter of state law when the city or the county creates an ordinance its violation can be punished as a misdemeanor that's what state law says so this is consistent with that okay. um, I think that uh, probably a lot of people didn't understand that and so this looked like it stands out as opposed to any other local ordinance but it's consistent so that's just what I was pointing out great thank you and the point that Dave um, made when we were meeting with the task force is that adopting the administrative citation ordinance gives that administrative tool so that the problem can be solved without going through the courts, which is uh, cumbersome. I mean, honestly, this was, was not and probably would not ever be a high priority for law enforcement when they have other things that they can be working on. So illegal dumping never really rose to the top of the list of that type of enforcement. So without Without this, we, we didn't have any good tools. Although I, I acknowledge that the city and county could and, and have done something similar to this. At least I know the county has uh, administrative citations. So I'm not sure what can be done to clarify when that, when, uh, who has or how that discretion is made between a, an administrative citation and, and a misdemeanor. But I appreciate Martha's clarification that that's standard state law requires that next Ted next um, these were put in they don't have any teeth and I know that there was some confusion over what this means um, at the time we were we were looking at an ordinance that had lots of uh, concepts and policies but just to be clear on this section 14 uh, it's more of a statement of intent than it is a, than it is a, a, an enforceable clause and I highlighted uh, the, the relevant points. We're reserving the right to take action if we need to, but it doesn't mean it's happened. And we're talking about uh, the kinds of ordinances that other cities and counties have done to try to deal with some of the hazardous products that um, cost us a lot of money like fluorescent tubes, uh, needles. Um, Alameda County just adopted a take back ordinance for pharmaceuticals. Um, so we believe that the city and the county and the solid waste authority would have the right to do that at any point without reserving this right. So these, these sections could easily be deleted, be deleted and you would give up nothing. Um, same thing with this, reserving the right 
and next uh, may impose. So just to be clear, these sections of the ordinance do not impose any obligation on, on anybody. It was a statement of um, interest and a reservation of rights. So, Kevin, if it's not imposable, is, is this the right place for it to be? Well, I think we're looking at ways that this can be changed, and I'm just trying to help point out the things that I think should stay, the things that could go away without any impact on, on policies or programs. That, that last section would, well, it just, it's wouldn't a give up bit. any rights. Should it have been in there in the first place? You know, you can ask that question, but. It seems a little ambiguous when you say that it's not imposable. Um, and my, my thought process is that I really liked the idea of, of the Sharps Take Back program that we yeah. implemented. Um, but I know that there are much bigger products, larger products yes. that could be very expensive for Take Back. Yes. Um, and I, I hate to see that fall on any local business. Right. So. And what I'm saying is none of that is in here. There's no requirements for local businesses. If you wanted it to. It says that if the state does not enact it by 2010, that the board. May. Okay. It's just a, it was just a statement of an opinion. Hmm? Yes, exactly, Mike. Yeah, it's not, it's not, uh, if you decided that you wanted to take any one product and, and pursue it in that way, it would take an entirely different set of actions before okay. you actually had something right, that was enforceable. Oh, this is kind of blurry, but this is to remind us why we started working on this. This is Pacific Shores. Carpet, tires, you name it. Um, makes me sick to look at it, so thank you for taking that off. Uh, that's it. That's, that's uh, my attempt at highlighting the things. The, the reasons that w this was started was, and I think it, it probably initiated with the board, this Solid Waste Task Force in 2007 spent more than 11 meetings in 2007 talking about all the ins and outs of this. A lot of good people spent a lot of good time and we should respect that. But even when this got moving forward for adoption um, and Martha helped draft it, so she's familiar with the ins and outs of this ordinance uh, and the board approved it, we had to acknowledge at the time that it, it, it couldn't possibly be perfect and there would have to be a, a possible changes and amendments to that. So. What I've tried to do today is remind us of why we did it in the first place, that a lot of people spent a good amount of time several years ago to make this happen. Uh, the problems have gotten better, we think, and you've heard Tommy say that, and I think that Dave Mason would acknowledge that some of the problems have gotten better, but we still have uh, some room to go. So there are some ways this ordinance could be approved, and if it was going to be uh, uh, reduced further beyond the things that, that I've suggested, then it would be wise to have a plan on how the same intent would be met. So that if this isn't the right tool, then what is the right tool for the job? And unless we agree that there's no longer any problem with the illegal dumping or blight, I think there's still a need to have a plan. So um, despite the fact that we spent time on this, um, I, I'm not defensive about any of the content and any ideas the board has or the task force has to make this better or stronger. I think it all has to be steered toward more effective, more efficient, if that's possible, and not just throw out the good with the bad and try to keep the good things and change the things that are either confusing or unnecessary. So that was my uh, attempt today, was to give you the highlights of the things I think could be changed, the errors that could be changed, how this could be made better or more clear, and I probably should just stop talking now. Great, thank you, Kevin. Any questions? I, I have a quick question, Kevin. Um, I, it involves self haulers and I look can you hear me yeah okay and it says the definition says a self hauler means a person who hauls discards generated on their premises to the appropriately permitted facilities in Del Norte uh, County at what point does a self hauler be, become registered or non registered in other words I would think that anyone that isn't doesn't have their garbage collected by our franchise uh, by a franchisee um, would be a self hauler so you, you, is it the intent to have all those people register? You know, when we started this, we thought yes, and now um, I'd have to refer back to whichever slide it was. The definition of self-haulers has like A through F. Yeah, so A 
I think the ones that we need to keep, the ones that we need to keep are prim primarily the okay. businesses. I just look, okay. Not, not the individual or businesses that are hauling their own garbage. That's not necessary and, and uh, other than the fact that we're going to give you a receipt as a self hauler and that's your proof that you came to the right place. And we have no interest in registering average regular. I didn't think so, but I looked at the definition and I thought. Right, that, you know, that's one of the things I think we, cha we should change is business and residential self haulers. But the, 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 the reason for registering landscapers, demolition companies, and uh, cleanup businesses is that, and the task force went through a whole range of possibilities. I mean, we have a franchise, a very complicated contract with a garbage company. If you're one of those businesses, we don't we barely, we know who you are because we know who you are when you come to us. Um, there was talk about whether they should be licensed, whether they should be, have permits, um, and we boiled it down to the, probably the simplest possible thing is register, tell us who you are. And the reason would be if you were a landlord and you needed a cleanup company, you could call and say, are these people registered? Which is to say, they bring the garbage to us versus a cleanup company that we don't know anything about that would make a lot more money if they didn't bring it to the transfer station. Same thing with the landscapers because it doesn't happen as much anymore, but landscapers still are tempted to go dump it off the bluff by Pebble Beach used to happen more, but I don't think it happens as much. Um, and the, and uh, well, and a lot of those, a lot of those accounts charge too. So. <coughs> right. To the extent that we have that they are charge customers, we know who they are. But if they were just a, a average pay pay by cash or by check customer, we wouldn't have a, a record of who they who they were. So that was the thought going into it. Uh, that if we had those kinds of businesses registered, we know who they are. Um, they're the ones that are except, exceptions to the exclusive franchise, so that's a business category that's pretty important. But it, it's not something that we currently want to do or have ever done, is registering uh, individuals or businesses that are hauling their own garbage, because that's something we want to preserve. At least this ordinance preserves that. Um, and that was the thought. Yeah. Martha? Yeah, it, in fact, backing up this ordinance when we were doing it, this, this section, we had actually cited someone for a, an illegal dump. And the poor person was like really, truly paid someone to come and take it and thought that it was really going to the dump, to the landfill. And, and they were ripped off and now they were being, all of a sudden now they had this big, huge cleanup. And it happened I, two or three times with um, when people would come to clean out rentals. The, the landlord would, would willingly pay and then the trash wouldn't get to, they thought they had paid a legitimate person to come and clean it, clean it up. So by having the registered hauler that does that kind of cleanup and demolition, it, it assists people in not getting ripped off because I'll, I'll be truthful when my nephew was 17 he took my garbage one time and I got a phone call from someone that my garbage was on French Hill and it was like I was mortified oh. that that had happened you know and so I learned never to hire my nephew again <laughs> <laughs> that was about 35 years ago but still it's just an example of that it was an attempt to try to take that piece out of our improper waste the people who improperly do the trash. And another one that I'd like to identify is like, for instance, with Dave Mason, we had a blight problem with a man who was, he was a car hoarder and had, I think it was a couple hundred cars on his property. I mean, and, and he was extremely troubled, but it was all over and it was, they were full of trash and it was a very, it was a very, um, uncomfortable situation for neighbors to have all of these cars and every, all of well, this and they happening. were buried in Were they the ones that would all start? Yeah. <laughs> yeah he he so thought like, they could all start. He said they yeah. would all start. But he never <laughs> ever went. I mean, That's we worked for months with him and he never went to a misdemeanor or anything like that. We ended up at a, he had a citation had to be, a, we had to declare a, bl a blight and 
and then move with a, with a cleanup that we was a lien to the property because mm -hmm. we had to abate it for him because he didn't have the money. But there was never any discussion to give that man a misdemeanor ticket or anything like that. So that's just a little history on. And I also, I'm going to throw one more thing in there. I'm sorry. During this most recent campaign cycle, I have some people that I walk with all the time that are my, that we do the neighborhoods with. And one of the comments that is a person who has walked with me three times, she said, you know what? I can't believe how much cleaner the neighborhood looks. And it was, a, it was one of my more troubled neighborhoods historically. And I believe that that's because the blight ordinance has ensured that there is garbage pickup and it's being taken care of because there weren't houses that had 12, 13, 14, 15 black bags in front of the house that were full of garbage and half open from the dogs. And it was actually, you can see it on the street if you walk in the neighborhoods. Thank you. Anything else from members? I had a quick question. Okay. Um, so as a matter of process, uh, We've directed, I'm just re reminding myself, we've directed the Solid Waste Task Force to continue with their matrix, to um, do that in, in conjunction with staff and uh, legal counsel, correct? And in that matrix, they're comparing the, our uh, ordinances and city and county ordinances. You know, I actually haven't been given a copy of the matrix, so I'm not sure what's in it, but I have met with them. Okay. Um, I was just going to suggest as, as um, kind of a part of that process that I think it could be important, an important piece to include uh, the city manager and the CAO um, in any um, additions or removals of information from um, the city and county ordinances to make I think the intent was to have them all um, the same, or the intent of each one to be the same. And so I just think that having the city and county, at least the city anyway, um, input uh, on that would be good. Okay. It Anything seems, else? It just seems like the, our, our uh, respective councils might be the more appropriate ones to review the, the ordinances in order to ensure they're, they're in alignment. This comment. And yeah, you're I think we've got a little ways to go before that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're you're suggesting review after recommendations. Is and that? I, I think. Well, we I just know that there was a comment yeah. made that that our our blight officer or whatever in, uh, code enforcer for the city um, was not using the city uh, um, ordinances or wasn't. Yeah. Um, no. That that he wasn't he didn't have the jurisdiction to enforce these ordinances, um, and that the city's ordinance was different than this ordinance. And I just thought maybe having some, you know, input from the city on how they're different or the same might be helpful. Well, and I think having the availability of legal available to the task force. Would be would be the suggestion as an alternative. Yeah, that was part of the direction yeah. last time. Yeah, and and you know I don't know what they're going to come back with for a recommendation. So I mean I think we have to get to that point before we. I just think the more people it. that see this matrix, you know, before it gets to the end, we'll save some time. Sure, I'd like to see it. Okay. I would tell you, so I, I would just like to add one more that for the task force, one of the one of the issues that I have heard when they've been here is that it's duplication of laws, that this is California law already. Why do we have another layer on this? And that's just, and part of it is, is because we can move it out of the court. We cannot have it as citations like misdemeanors and that kind of thing. We can actually take care of our own business in our own community and not try to clog this in a court system of high cost. So I know that part of their matrix they do have where they're trying to compare it to California law, but you need to understand that California law moves it into the judicial system that's already costing us an arm and a leg, where a hearing system to try to be problem solving is much more effective and much more efficient. So I would like them to keep that in mind. 
Yeah, and if I just may um, observe that um, both Ted and I have been regularly attending the Solid Waste Task Force meetings. We're salaried, exempt employees. We don't get overtime. It doesn't cost any more. Um, but it, it may be the case with uh, city staff attending meetings that that might be overtime. So that could be a consideration. And our, of course, our, our attorney is very valuable and she charges hourly. So we'll want to be focused on because that's an expense. And then you count on me to control expenses. So we'll. All those resources are available. I think the Solid Waste Task Force with the new membership is working real hard to try to understand why these things happened. And, and based on my uh, experience at the last meeting, I think they're getting uh, closer to understanding some of the reasons. And I don't know what they ultimately will recommend, but that's uh, at, what I hear Jerry saying is that, that makes sense that that would be the point where we would look at if that's a conflict or otherwise. In the meantime, I will take a look at the city and county ordinances again to see if there's any conflicts. I know there was also questions about whether there are conflicts with this ordinance and the, the franchise agreement. I don't think there are any. Uh, if they are, they're not major, but I, I did promise the task force that I would both give them a copy of that franchise agreement and take a look to see if there are any conflicts with that. Okay. Yeah. But the I thought we had a hearing officer set up, though, county and city that we, we jointly do. use. So I'm not sure why necessarily administrative citations would necessarily go through the courts. It doesn't. No. no that's, where the, that's where the administrative no. citation goes through. I, I'm saying that if you, if part, of the, if part of the argument is to remove something from this because it's already existing state law, therefore why are we making more government? It's really a way of how we can deal with it locally and not have to put it through the court system because the court system, it, it, it's so overburdened and it's so expensive. You know, I mean, we give somebody a citation for trash and they get a public defender and it costs us hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of dollars where through the hearing process it costs us a hundred dollars, you know what I mean? Well, the, the other alternative that the task force could come, well, it, we'll see what they do say, but the other thing they could say is to not necessarily have a solid waste ordinance, but to have a county and city ordinance that are the same. Right. And so you, right. you strip away that. Right. Yeah. If the task force could find or, or wanted to make a finding that uh, upgrading the city and county ordinances to make them in sync and with some of the same tools that were in this ordinance, if that was found to be more efficient or more effective or, or more desirable, that's an option. Yeah. But um, there's a lot of good work that went into this. There's a lot of good tools that are in this ordinance. And, and one way or the other, I'll just continue to point out, and Dave Mason, I think, will be helpful in pointing out the tools that are helpful for him that he didn't have before. Great. Anything else? Any public comment? Mr. Miles. when a special meeting of the task force was held and a vote was taken. Today, I'd like to make this suggestion. And I want to thank Kelly for mentioning something. I personally think that a few years ago, the county and the city should have stepped up as two entities, reviewed their own ordinances, and the legality of those ordinances and fix their own ordinances. If at that time the task force doesn't believe that that doesn't fix the problem, because I'm only one vote, uh, that would be my recommendation. But I want to state something else too that Martha, Miss Murray, and some other people did not mention today. As, as for these mobile home parks, you have a county vector person at the health department. If a landlord, whether it's a trailer park or anybody else, is attracting rats, Dave Mason doesn't have that authority. Your vector person does. And you talk about the state coming down on somebody, 
that's a health issue. That's in the health and safety code. Also, I want to remind this board, and especially some of the city members, that when the city decided to cite Mr. Deal, who lives in Oregon, they didn't, Washington, thank you, Kelly. I always thought he lived in Oregon. They used the state state law, not, not the Solid Waste Authority ordinance or their own ordinances to go after Mr. Deal about his tansy and blackberries and his blight on his property. They used the state, state laws. There's been incidents in this county, and the one I want to cite is a gentleman that had all the tires that the st state had to clean up. They are incidents where the only way you're going to make, like Mr. the county blight officers, you've got 20 percent of people that don't give a shit, and you're going That's to enough, have That's enough, Richard. Thank you. You're going to have to use the courts. Wes? Wesley Nunn, uh, task force member. I can't speak on behalf of the task force, of course, but uh, in my opinion, a little of each on the matter of whether to have counsel intervene or give opinions as we go. I think for the most part, uh, Kevin is right that um, we wait until the full recommendation. However, there are a few places where we kind of stall out or hit a bump. Um, and. Uh, an opinion from county council on a very limited thing would help at those points. So if you consider direction we or giving last, us... We did at the last meeting. Yeah. Pardon? We provided that at the last meeting. Okay. It sounded like yeah. it was being discussed again, so... No. They've, yeah. got, they've got direction. From a city level is what I was discussing. Yeah. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thanks. As of today, we haven't had any uh, requests for legal... Um, opinions, but if we do get one, what I would recommend just in the interest of time would be to have them compile the list of questions and write them down so that Martha can do it when she has time and, and give answers. Yep, sounds good. Andy? To Andy Larson, the county rep, is my name. Yep. Um, to clarify your state issue, the, the county can't do anything to force a state mobile home park to do anything. They can, if the mobile home park determines garbage as a utility, the state code allows for the mobile home park to raise the rent for the utility. The mobile home park can't just arbitrarily raise the rent, and say, hey, you got to go get garbage, and I'm going to raise your rent. That state law doesn't allow that. The mobile home park is inspected by the state, not the county or not the city. But anyway, back to the, the name, personally, the Solid Waste Recycling Responsibility Ordinance. We, to me, I look at it, there's some good things in it. Everybody should be responsible for their own garbage. I'm responsible for mine, and, and I think everybody should be. I don't think it should go to land owners and try to say, hey, we're going to pinch you to make sure you do it, and we're working through that. But to make 24 pages and get into where you're not sure if I'm a self-hauler or if I'm infringing upon the rights of recology, I do a job. I take not only my trash and self-haul, I take their trash and I charge them for my time. Am I infringing on recology? If I charge them a fee to take that, I, there's a lot of issues that I see personally in this ordinance that you build a bureaucracy and all of a sudden you're accounting for a lot of things. So you gotta have this organization put together to take care of what? You got to take. You got to have responsibility for your trash, and if you don't, I'm going to fine you. I'm going to make you pick it up. We're going to have penalties. You don't need 24 pages, in my opinion. Understanding full well 
if the city and the county got together and made their ordinance, you wouldn't have to pay attention to the state, understand that. And you would take out some of the pages. You get unclear when you make things lengthy. The federal government seems lengthy. And this, this law, if you go and really read this ordinance, I'll guarantee, even though there's been a lot of hard work, you will get lost in it, and you will, it does not have to be that complicated. Andy, take your trash. You can't, when you put in an ordinance that I've got to cover my garbage, the state already tells me I've got to cover my garbage. If it goes on the road, I'm in trouble already. I don't need another ordinance telling me that. Thanks, Andy. We'll call it the Andy Ordinance. Okay, done with public comment. Uh, since we're gonna be waiting for a recommendation before we get started on this, there will be no action, or I expect no action on this item. Um, if there's nothing else from commissioners and nothing else from the public, we'll move on. Okay, 7.5. We got some priorities that uh, uh, staff would like to get direction from this board uh, on they seem to be uh, having a time issue, and uh, we'd like to help them with that all we can. So I don't know how you want to go about this, uh, Kevin, uh, whether you would like us to, everybody to write their priorities down and hand them in to you, or you want to discuss this now, and I think we're just well, going to get a hodgepodge. We're just going to drag this out, I think, if we... How if long we, is the extended period? How long is the extended period? The extended period of? Of leave. Oh, the staffing issue? Yes. Extended leave of absence. Uh, it can be up to a year. Um, what we're planning right now is to have existing staff, is to keep that position vacant temporarily, at least through the end of this year, before we look at trying to fill it, for one, because there'd be some cost savings there, which would be greater than closing on Sunday, I think. Um, and can I just, do you mind if I ask a couple questions? Were you done? Oh, I'm not done until Kelly says I'm he done. He interrupts me all the time, so I thought I'd <laughs> oh. give it back to him. You're the boss. You interrupt any time. Well, I, th I thought I'd clarify my question better. Um, I was curious about the timing and then what that person's duties are, how much time they spend per week doing it. Rose. Okay. You're talking about Rose? I'm talking about whatever administrative position we're uh, discussing. Uh, okay. We don't have to give it a name. And right here, administrative assistant. Yes, I, yeah, I, I our that. administrative assistant yeah. is Rose, and it's a good time to talk about it because um, she will be taking a leave, and the county personnel policy allows that to be up to a year to keep the job open for that period of time, so we're trying to uh, uh, accommodate that to some extent. Okay. Um, Rose is also your clerk, um, so at the next board meeting, we will have to have an action to temporarily appoint Ted as your clerk. Um, Ted's going to be helping take over the clerking part of, of that job. Um, I'm going to be taking a more hands-on direct role in staffing, scheduling, uh, administrative functions of the transfer station to make sure that the transfer station is staffed and open every day, which is what we all want. Um, we, have an we have an account clerk who's quite talented and I think she'll be able to take on some of the additional accounting functions. So we're basically taking this job and splitting it up three ways to try to get through this. Um, but it, the bottom line for us is that when, especially when you're looking at your two program staff, Ted and I, when we're taking on these other duties, it becomes even more challenging to keep up. Um, when this 10-member board started, um, everybody was hungry for information and, and more stuff. 
so there's been a big pile up of, of things that have been asked either through a vote or through direction or consensus and um, I think it's only responsible for me to tell you how we're doing with those and that I haven't forgotten about them but some of these things have not happened yet and, and it's not due to any lack of respect or interest but it's a daily uh, process of juggling staff and availability to try to get the things done that we can get done and the state just never seems to run out of new ideas of things for us to do. So there's a couple new tasks that have to rise high on the list. One is we need to quantify the amount of gas coming out of the landfill, which has never been done and never been asked before. Um, we have a five-year requirement that we review the corrective action plan for the landfill, so that is coming up. Some of these things have not even been in front of this board yet, but we know that they're coming, and because it's a state agency requiring it, we know that they'll be a, they will have to be a priority. <coughs> so what I've done is taken all the things that were on my to-do list and organized them in a way that I think is the priority in which we can or should get them done. And um, your suggestion, Jerry, of having every individual board member tell me what their priorities are would be challenging for me because it's to some extent, some of these are on my list because it was requested by one or two board members and when there's conflicts between what one bo board member wants and another board member, then it becomes hard for me to, I mean. Uh, well, I just think, it, uh, excuse me for just a minute, but I, I, I just think it gets more cumbersome if we're all discussing that and um, I think that gets a lot more involved and stretches things out a lot worse. Um, but. I don't have a problem with having an orderly way of doing it, um, uh, but um, I, I don't know how that would work in a format like this where there's 10 of us without everybody writing their stuff down and then you put it together and say this is what, you know, six of you wanted this thing to be first and four of you wanted this thing to be second and, you know, I mean, I don't know how you, I, I don't know how you, to do it, but um, all of these things are relatively important. Um, personally, I would say the resource recovery part, the commercial fluorescent lamps, um, certainly belong at the bottom of this list. Um, uh, you know, maybe even the composting pilot and the, you know, I, I don't know about these five year review plans and that kind of stuff, you know, how that plays into this. Even depreciation is just something that you do. Um, so I don't know why that's even a priority on here. The, the waste discharge fee, I think, would be priority number one, mm -hmm. uh, without question. Um, we should be looking at that. This is just my own personal views. And all the input that we've had on the ordinance, uh, I would think, would be number two, just because that's at the top of the list. And privatization. Um, was a, a thing that we started looking at so um, and then and then maybe the five-year corrective or the five-year review of the corrective action plan so that would be my one two three four I don't know how everybody else feels about that Mine aren't all set. see that's exactly what I'm saying so then you're gonna have this discussion and then uh, Miss Murray's gonna have one and then Donna's gonna have one and Rich is gonna have one and there might be one or two off so I don't know how you get to I mean those four to me are r relatively important well they're all important that's why they're on the list they're all things that you've asked us to well, do you're exactly right Kevin they're all important and that's your job and I've, you're the manager and I don't think we should be micromanaging and if you think you need direction then I would think that maybe you would want to talk to the individual board members and see if your priorities your understanding of the priorities are in line with with their priorities and handle it that way. They have a, you know, an eraser board where we all put our top three or we our get the stickers. buttons out and start playing right. them on the wall. You know, that kind of micromanaging, that's great at, when you're planning for a social program or, or something new at the Family Resource Center, but not this. Well, to be you know, clear, that's, that's your job. I'm not asking you to micromanage, that's just the way it's turned well, it out. Sure sounded like it. No, no, no. no, that's what we've been telling him. And that's I, what you've... Can I make a recommendation that we have This is staff? my order of priorities. This is my ranking. This is my work. Okay. And if you're not going to micromanage, this is the order I will take them in. I'm that's perfectly fine order. with that. Fine. And then this discussion fine. is over. That's your job. Good. Thank you, David. 
I would Ms. like Schuchman. to make a motion to Excuse accept me. the uh, the priority list as presented. Okay. Catherine, did you have something you I want to say? I was just going, I, I'll second that, and I just wanted to say that that's what I was going to indicate is that I think that staff has a better understanding of what the priorities are based on state mandates and their requirements as opposed to what our personal preferences are. So I, I, I second that motion. I was going to, to suggest that um, everybody taking on a full-time position um, in addition to your job is going to be difficult to manage, um, but I'm sure you can do it. But I was just going to say as far as the clerk position um, actually here doing the, you know, the record keeping that, you know, maybe we outsource that to, you know, Karen. Yes, secretarial or something. Someone that's very familiar with the process and um, Karen Phillips. Efficient. Take one less thing off of yeah, Ted's. I, that occurred to me, and the Just cost as a the cost of that would be fairly small, and that would help. Um, but we still will still need to oversee that. And, and it's still going to stay this way at least through the end of the year. Yeah. To save money. And and that's a fairly small time constraint. I don't know if she's available, but I don't know either, right. but she's talented and she would be Good helpful. Idea. I do have to disagree with David. I don't very often, but I do have to disagree yeah. with David. Well, that's uh, what you're saying is you're looking at your name plate. Yeah. Well, <laughs> I, I see that, but, but look at yours. I don't care. In the... Uh, you know that this is I, I don't consider this micromanagement when these are uh, issues that have been brought up by this board and and the idea of, of prioritizing them that's coming from the board I don't know that's necessarily micromanaging um, it's it's things that this board has requested and I think that's what Kevin is asking at the level at what level are we requesting these um, you know I mean it's just uh, and, and if you're calling that micromanagement, then... Um. No, no, I think is where I got uh, lost in the discussion is the first thing that I keyed on is you were going to have a personnel issue, mm -hmm. and you were asking us how to handle it, and that's your oh, job. Oh, yeah, no, I, yeah. I, was, I was only talking about the priorities I, and, and projects. We're going you need to readjust priorities or whatever, and you're having a problem with it, I said, then have a conversation with people. But uh, to, for us to do that here just didn't seem right. Well, I, I think he... Said he's hand, he knows how he's going to handle it, but based on these priorities, where do we want him to focus, right? Because right. he's going to have additional duties. Martha? And you know where that comes from? That comes from an evaluation process that happens annually where you look at what the goals were, you look at what the priorities were, and you look at how it was done. Now, there might be some people who haven't filled out their, their, their evaluations yet, and the evaluation should have done, been done last March. Was it, was it March? Some yeah. time ago. So, you know, and then to get up here and try to, I agree, micromanage, because my position is I've watched these, I've watched this organization work, and they will attempt and carefully address every one of these priorities that are on these two pages. So I would urge that uh, my fellow commissioners support the, the, the motion, and I will call the question. Any public comments? Seeing no public comment, um, I don't know that we need to poll this vote. So, um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? No. No. Uh, no. Okay, Rose, would you poll the vote, please? Commissioner Holly? Yes. Commissioner Westfall? No. Commissioner Murray? Yes. Commissioner Schlong? Yes. Commissioner Ania? No. <clears throat> Commissioner Finnegan? Yes. Commissioner, Ma excuse me, McNamer? Yes. Commissioner McClure? Yes. Commissioner Sullivan? Yes. Chair Hamilton? No. <clears throat> Thank you. What was the? Uh, it's passed. Passes. Seven to three. Passes. Well, it has to be three and three. three, three. three whatever um, it is. But we did. Yeah. Yep. Motion we passes. 
Okay. So we are going to uh, close session. Kevin, anything? Yeah, let's have a closed session. For? To talk about my evaluation. No, we're going to have an open session to talk about your closed session. I mean, to talk about your evaluation. <laughs> um, anybody who has not gotten their evaluation papers in, please do so. Please give them to Joey or make sure they get to Joey uh, at, at the county clerk's office, please. And we will have an evaluation at the next meeting with whatever is up there. Okay, if you don't put yours in, just wait a second. And then we will start over and hand out stuff for the second one. And with that, we are adjourned. Do we need to send them in again if we already sent them? No. No.